uh, still going to join us. All right, I want to welcome everyone once again to another edition of the um, African Medical Physicist coming together to build a community and uh, also keep abreast of research prospects that are out there. And today we will be reviewing a material that um, is one of the hot topic, especially in mortal energy CT. Um, recently, the AAPM, that's the American Station of Medical Physicists, they published a task group report on this topic. It was published earlier this year in 2020. And I think it's an interesting thing, an interesting topic to look into. So today we we are going to be experimenting just because this op, um, concept and things that we want to try out a different approach to what we had the last time. Last time we had a case where we had a presenter, um, Mr. Bayomi, who gave us a very wonderful presentation on the topic we looked at the other day. And today we hope to try a different method where the floor is open to everyone to comment on the paper. And we did that to, in order to ensure that that's why we had the paper sent to everyone ahead of time so that hopefully we can we could have reviewed those material and be able to explain one aspect of it in order to like help each other to understand the topic at hand. So that's the approach we'll be going with today. Each section of the paper will be for about 10 minutes each and the floor will be open for everyone to give a comment what part of the section appeals to you the most what do you think the author could have emphasized on in a particular aspect and which how best can we interpret the intention of the writer in that instance and conclude on what next that is what can we do moving on from the information we've been able to gather together from the whole review review process and like i said each, each for each section it's going to be 10 minutes each and I would try, I, I made up some point of discussion from reading through it. But again, that is just more like a guide. Hopefully everyone can come up with something important for each section that they think is really worth looking at for us to all discuss on them. The other thing uh, would be that we're, we're gonna be time conscious. And because of that, for every contribution, each speaker or anybody commenting would have just maximum of two minutes to raise a point on that particular topic. So we want to adhere to time so that everyone can have free chance to comment on the, um, each section. Uh, before I proceed, I remember one of the suggestions from the last meeting is for us to have the opportunity to get to know ourselves because that way uh, we can, because we, we might not know actually in our midst we have some professors and like so it won't be appropriate for us to just keep on going without actually getting to meet our bosses and everyone in the field so um in a way to start implementing that we are going to give chance to the first two persons that actually joined the meeting today for them to give us in briefly in two minutes their names what they do as a medical physicist or whichever field they're in and um just for us to get to know them at least in two minutes um i know it may come as a way of surprise but i have two persons that i noted that joined early on um i'm sorry if i'm not attaching the uh right preface to it whether doctor professor or something i'm really sorry for that i may not be so much aware but i have the first person is kaya that uh, and the next is uh according to the name I'm seeing on uh, the Zoom. So please, can you, in two minutes, please introduce yourself, your research area, what you do in medical physics, and um, yeah, thank you. Anyone can go first. I think Mr. Mr. or Mrs. Kaya, they want to, yeah. Hello? Hello? Hi. Hi. Okay, good, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. 
Good evening. Okay, I'm good evening. I'm good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. A medical physicist yes, in radiation oncology. Glad to have you, ma. You're welcome. Thank and you. thank you for organizing this. I'm attending this program for the first time anyway. Oh. I wasn't able to attend the last one, so this is my first time of attending this. Okay. Thank you very much, ma. Dr. Akira. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Yes. All right. We have another person who joined, Coyote. That uh, please, can we get to know you? And we don't mind if you want to turn on your video so that I'm not the only one with my video on. <laughs> um, we can't hear you at this point. I guess something has to do about the audio at your own end. OK, maybe at some point as we move on, we will be able to come back to this. Um, I'm sorry, maybe you have some um, connection issue or something. OK, so we'll be moving on to the paper. And what I would do, my role here is not as a presenter. I'm not a presenter. I'm just help just to keep the um, uh, what's it called? The discussion flowing. That's the that's my purpose here. And so I'll be starting out by giving us the intention of the writer, which is captured in the abstract, and then we can then pick each topic and talk about it. Like I said, each section will be for ten minutes. The abstract reading shouldn't take me more than two or three minutes. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, give me one second. Yeah, it's green. Okay. All right. So this is the paper we're looking at as an acknowledgement to the author. And as a supporting material, we're using the just published APM um, report. All right, according to the author, he started by introducing the purpose of the paper, especially we know that's what the abstract should contain. It says dual energy computer tomography CT is to reconstruct images of an object from two projection data set generated from two distinct S resources, source energy spectra. It says it can provide more accurate attenuation quantification than conventional CT with a single S3 energy spectrum. In the diagnostic energy range, S3 energy dependent attenuation can be approximated as a linear combination of photoelectric absorption and Compton scattering. Hence, two physical components of S3 attenuation can be determined from the spectrally informative projection data set to achieve monochromatic imaging and material decomposition. Now to the uh, goal of the paper. A projection decomposition method is proposed for image reconstruction in dual energy CT this method combines both an analytical algorithm and a single variable optimization method to solve the nonlinear polychromatic S-ray integral model, allowing accurate quantification of photoelectric absorption and Compton scattering components. Numerical tests are performed to illustrate the merits of the proposed method by comparing with classical projection decomposition methods. So right from the abstract, we can see the intention of the writer. He started, he or she, I don't know, started by introducing the uh, concept and idea of dual energy CT and went ahead to describe the goal of the paper by saying they are coming up with a projection decomposition method. Okay, so in this paper, we expect to see why the projection, what um, previous decomposition methods are and then why the new method as proposed and how that outperformed the other ones. I think that's what the paper should address from the abstract, just reading through it. So I'll go ahead now and open the floor while we move on to the introduction piece. Reading through the material, what can we, what um, are the things that pop up to us as regarding the introduction section? 
I'm going to stop my time for this section because it's just it's, thank you. We're expecting comments. Can I start by asking if we read the paper? <laughs> Hello. Um, hi, Olivia. Yeah. Can Thank you, you please check for slides again? I couldn't complete within that. So I encourage us to share our thoughts on the material because it's going to be better than one person going through this because we may have different perspective to this topic in question, which will be helpful to everyone, I guess, I believe. Hopefully we've been able to go through the abstract now. Um, we're moving on to the introduction section. And let us remember, we have this paper attached to the email that was sent out. So you can have it opened up somewhere on your laptop to see more on the abstract section. Okay, I'll be moving on to the introduction part now just to save some time because obviously there are still a lot of section in the paper. Thank you. So the question is, who is going to build the cat? <laughs> Anyone? OK, maybe I can kind of stir up the conversation a little bit from looking at the paper. This is where the point I was able to like see from the introduction. The author addressed the limitations of convectional CT, which we are all used to and familiar with, and then explained why dual energy CT is better. Then, okay, I'm having a suggestion from someone. Okay, thank you. Then the author move on to talk about how that can be implemented. I think in just two lines, explain how it can be implemented, looking at the different uh, image reconstruction methods, and then establish a rationale for the proposed uh, projection decomposition method. So that's the, the, the introduction. I think this was what it covered. And I'll be glad if we can say something about these things so that um, every one of us can get to learn about it. So I'm going to try this again, one more attempt for comments. <laughs> okay. All right, in a quick uh, bit, I'll, I'll make a quick pass on, on the paper. If we, if we have the paper with us as in our software, uh, in any of our devices, because again, it was sent to us, we can um, look through the content of the material if we have not read it before now. But again, that was the goal of sending it ahead of time because the journal club is meant to be an open floor section for us all to be able to just discuss on the topic. 
Um, any comments? Okay. This is to all right. I'll move on to summarize a little bit on what the author said. Um, I'll move on to summarize a little bit on what the author said. So for conventional CT, again, I'm not meant to be a presenter. <laughs> for conventional CT, the point the author made was about the fact that in conventional CT, we are aware that that S-ray energy information is actually ignored because our, our beam that is coming right from the S-ray source is a polyenergetic, is a polychromatic source. And in that case, we have a, a we have a form of um, averaging effect that is being factored into our reconstruction algorithm. Okay, I'll move on to showing some points that I noted from that aspect. Give me a second to set this up. All right, looking at the fact that attenuation coefficients normally in the, in the body is dependent, is energy dependent. That is, um, this is a typical graph that shows um, attenuation um, coefficients based on energy and a little bit of the K absorption um, energy there. So, but, but in, in reality, our reconstruction algorithm doesn't take into effect this energy dependence property of the attenuation coefficients. It just work off an average value. We have our source, uh, we have the energy spectrum from the, um, now this is the S-ray spectra. It's not just monoenergetic. It has going from low energy to some high energy, depending on our filtration. And in that case, that energy dependence is factored into, is factored into the actual image that we get out but our reconstruction algorithm doesn't take that into account. It just assumed that this is a, mono, a monochromatic source. And how it did that is by taking the average of this, by taking the average of this spectra. In that case, we are gonna be having an issue with beam hardening. That is, which, which moves on to the second portion of what the author was talking about. A beam hardening case where as the, as the, as the, as the beam is passing through the patient, there is a selective absorption of the lower energies. In that case, your average energy keeps shifting to a higher value. It, and again, you're not gonna have a constant half value layer. So normally for a monochromatic uh, beam, your half value layer should just be in a single value, which is the slope. It should just, the slope of an, in, in your, um, the attenuation should just be a single one. But for a, polychromatic beam, since you have low and high energy, as you go, as the beam passes through the patient or a given object, the lower energies are selectively absorbed and the, the average energy shifts a little bit. So you have a form of streaking artifact showing up in your uh, final reconstructed image. And that is common to all um, CT images. Of course, this may not be obvious because there are other reconstruction algorithms that helps to suppress that in the final image that we get out. But this is inherent to conventional CT images. So it's, it serves as a disadvantage, okay? So that was looking at point one as raised there. Does anyone have any comment regarding this? I'm receiving some messages in the chat section. Someone actually proposed, okay. I've gotten three messages saying we did not read through the paper. And so, yeah. Is somebody trying to bail me out here from just being the only one talking? Because I had this hand. Please, if you if you want to suggest an idea of how we can proceed better to get this, please, uh, I would say you go ahead and tell us so we can move on and enjoy this together. Uh, 
I think you can go ahead with this. Okay. All right. So, from your suggestion, I'll go ahead and and um, quickly run through the content of the material. Like I said, the auto points are the limitation of functionality, which is what I'm already pointing out. The fact that we are using an average energy from a polychromatic source, whereas our attenuation coefficient in itself is energy dependent, and so we lose that information. Um, to I think, I think we're having a bit difficulty hearing and you. And then at the end, we can discuss questions if there are any. Okay. Thank you for your suggestion and I'll move on with this so that we can use our time well. Okay. Thank you. So like I mentioned, so we have an issue. We have the energy averaging based on the polychromatic uh, concept. And then we have this beam admin showing up in our image. So if we, if we look at dual energy CT, what, where that one is coming in is the fact that our attenuation coefficient is dependent on energy and it's largely determined by two processes. That is when s interacts with the patient, there are two major physical processes that go into play, which is a photoelectric effect and a Compton effect. And the photoelectric effect itself is determined by the chemical composition that is you have an effective atomic number that, that modulates the photoelectric effect. The higher the atomic number, the more that um, cross-section for the photoelectric interaction. Again, and we have the uh, Compton effect. The Compton effect is, is related more to the electron density. And in that case, those two components are, are chiefly what constitute attenuation in the patient within this energy range. And so if we can somehow decompose those two components, we will be able to separate out the material effect from that um, um, image. Because for instance, we can have a case where you have two CT numbers from an image that looks the same. And what is responsible for each signal may be different. That is, we can have two signals that have the same value, but for one, it was because of the high chemical composition, while for the other one, it can be because of the high mass density. But the two of them might look alike. And in that case, we won't be able to distinguish if this is iodine or bone or something else, because now you have the, the two effects competing to create that CT number that you have. Um, this is just a little bit of review, I think, from the basic theory of CT images. So the concept for dual energy is that decomposition, that is we are able to separate out the photoelectric effect aspect and the Compton effect from the image. And that will give us an information about the material composition because in, in, that, in that cross section, we can see how this factor comes into play. And that was what the paper explained in that aspect. So, and this, this idea was actually proposed by Compton himself, uh, sorry, by Hansfield himself in 1973. So it's not actually a new idea. That is, it is possible for us to decouple the effect of the effective atomic mass, uh, atomic number. I'm using the word effective because it's a combination of different material, not necessarily just one, just like the human body. And then you can talk about the mass density of that particular tissue you're looking at. My intention is not to present, like I said from the beginning, we were supposed to have a conversation, but I'm moving to this just to give an overview because I, it appears many of us didn't actually go through the material, which is fine. This is an experiment. See which method worked best for us in this journal club. All right, so moving on, I went forward to the additional resources to look at the motivation for multi-energy CT. 
And it turns out that it's really, really useful. And now it's going into clinical applications where you characterize the physical properties that you can observe from an image. You can separate materials that have the same CT number at a single energy, as I said earlier. So largely is used for material decomposition. That is, we can look at an image and factor out a section that depend on just the mass density and another section that depend on the chemical. It helps to improve our quantitative accuracy. This, this can even, I think now it's useful more in radiation therapy. It's serving as an advanced imaging techniques in radiation therapy to actually do a form of segmentation. And um, again, point five there is looking at quantifying contrast agent concentration from, from the image. So the dual energy CT really helps to factor out these. And so from, from our image, we can see more than just seeing the collective um, attenuation coefficient. We can then split them into what could have been responsible for that signal that we're getting from that uh, in that image. All right, moving on to point four uh, that I noticed from the introduction, the author then begin to describe the form of image reconstruction methods that we have. That is, if we want to decompose these two components of the attenuation coefficients, we can do it before we form our image, or we can do it after we get the image. So before we form our image, we represent the, a reconstruction method in the projection domain. Again, we know that CT data set are just projection data set. You are projecting an attenuation function on a form of a line integral of an attenuation function as the beam passes through the patient. So we can do our decomposition that is separate, solving our integral in such a way that we separate out those two components, or we can do it after we form the image by doing a form of a linear matrix inversion, which I think I'll talk about a little bit in the next um, slide. But the problem is inherently these two methods are a little bit subject to noise just because the energy range we're working with, the attenuation coefficients a little bit overlap. That is the effect of Compton and, um, and um, the effect of Compton and photoelectric in this case, looking at two energy um, images a little bit overlap. So there is no much of a separation between them. And so we have a lot of noisy image. All right, thinking about the projection domain, like I mentioned, um, this is our beam passing through, passing through the patient, and we obtain a form of projection. That projection literally is represent, represents the um, attenuate the sum the linear line integral of the attenuation coefficients, like I mentioned earlier on. And a lot of mathematics is done going into this. For instance, the radon transform will help us to kind of rewrite that expression in a form of a line integral. And once we are able to figure that, then Fourier analysis come into play and we obtain a form of a, a sinogram that looks like this. The sinogram is just looking at your data at each projection versus the angle because you're going to, the gantry, uh, sorry, the tube rotates around the patient. So you are taking snapshots, the projection image at different angles. So as it rotates through the patient, you get a data set for that particular angle. In the, then we de they decompose that via radon transform and that that is what is um, plotted as a sinogram it is from this sinogram that our image is actually reconstructed because all of this encoding this will be a, a, some frequency information that when you do a Fourier transform can be represented in a special domain like the normal image that we see okay and that is so that this is the aspect that this paper was looking at like how can we do our manipulation in the projection domain whereby we are able to separate out the photoelectric effect and the Compton effect that will be able to tell us the different material composition and the chemical composition that end up forming the entire image. Looking at the image domain, like I said, it's just a matrix implementation where you're doing, you have a decomposition matrix, and then you are expressing every signal that you, every pixel value that you see there as a linear combination based on a basis matrix, a basis material. For instance, your basis material can be water and iodine like this. So they have a particular attenuation value. Then every other material like calcium and something else will then be expressed as a linear combination of water and iodine. That way it's easy for you to interpret the image because now you know that this is calcium, but that calcium is expressed in form of 
a combination of water and iodine, then you can easily separate it out from the image. The rationale for the proposed method, according to the author, was based on the limitation of the other uh, materials, which is uh, listed here. There are different methods that have been used in time past, like the lookup table method. So in the lookup table method, what they do is a form of, typically you're generating a table whereby you're looking at the intensities that you have across an image, then you grid them, then you, you're taking an inverse of that, which is similar to how the image domain work as well. Most of this thing is redundant. It's just where you are doing what that matters. And then via an interpolation, you are able to figure the numbers that are within each um, attenuation range. Then the image domain itself is inaccurate because this image domain will still have the limitation of the normal convectional city. You still have beam admin there because you already have your final image. Since you already have your final image, anything you're doing will just be a propagation of the error that has started with the initial convectional image uh, that you have. But when, if you're working in the projection domain, by separating the two out, you automatically factor out that beam admin effect because now you have already made it energy dependent. And so the proposed method is looking at how we can quickly implement this in the projection domain using a quasi analytic method that just requires a single variable optimization. Moving on to the methodology of the paper, the methodology there is looking at explaining what the components of this, uh, of the linear attenuation coefficient is. And then it went on to build a theory for the projection decomposition and then describe two methods that he uses to do the optimization. For the photoelectric effect, and so, like I said again, the photoelectric effect and the Compton effect are the dominant process in this range. And then we can treat them as, um, each of them have a spatial and energy dependent component. That is, if you look at the probability for photoelectric effects happening, it goes to the, like Z to the power of four and then one over E cube. So in that sense, it is both spatially dependent and it's energy dependent. And likewise, the Compton effect. We say the Compton effect is directly related to the electron density. And this, this expression here just gives you the electron density. Well, the other aspect there is looking at the interaction cross-section based on the energy dependent. And that was figured out with some weird mathematics by these two guys here that worked uh, on some of the Compton derivation to give us the scattering cross-section based on this Compton effect. So now we can, treat, we can treat the photoelectric effect and the Compton effect separately. And within each of, of them, we can, do, we can also treat them as having a spatial component and an energy component. For the energy component of these two, it's easy to calculate those ones because they are mathematical functions that are already known. And the author introduced that function on page two of the paper, that is the function for the energy component. So essentially what we are solving for when we mean, when we are, when we're doing dual energy CT is looking for this spatial component, the AR and the CR in this case as denoted by the author. So you, this PE and QE have an expression already, theoretically that has been derived for them. So we can easily calculate that for any energy we're working on. But what we need to know, because we have an ensemble, we have a material that has a lot of different composition and the likes, we need to solve for AR and, and CR in that expression. So that is essentially what dual energy city is doing, to be able to factor out that, mati that aspect of the attenuation coefficient that depend on the Compton effect and that depend on the photoelectric effect. I hope we are doing well so far. Like I said, I didn't actually prepare to present this. It was supposed to be a discussion. Nevertheless, I'll move on to the projection decomposition theory, which is what the author began to build. Again, this is this is our general. This is the general integral that that describe what we are actually measuring. So if you have a CT, if you have a CT, um, a CT machine, you have your detector, you have the patients right at the center, and then you turn on your, the whole system to work, then you have the X-ray leaving the source going into the patient. I1 is what you measure at a particular detector. That's what you get at a detector. And that will give you, that value will be based on that 
energy distribution, which is X1. Again, because it's polychromatic, that's why you're going from a particular minimum energy to the highest energy, depending on how you filter your beam. So you have an E min to an E max, and then you have the energy spectrum going into the patient. But what you measure at the detector has been attenuated by this exponential factor here, which has the photoelectric component now and the uh, Compton component. Normally in a typical um, CT expression, it won't be separated here. It's just gonna be one single value and it's gonna represent an average value. That is the normal CT. But for dual energy CT, we need to actually split out these two components. So what the auto now, the way, for, the way we can get AR and CR, we have two unknowns. We have two unknowns and to get two unknowns, we need two equations. Normally, if we're solving a quadratic, um, a simultaneous equation, I mean, in two unknowns, then you need two equations. So in order for us to get our two equations, we need two images, one from a low energy and one from a high energy. And that's why the name dual energy city. So you're getting, you're getting an intensity value based on a low energy and then one based on a high energy. Then we want to solve for AR and CR. In order for the author to do that, the author then did a form of um, expansion. He did, he did a series expansion, a Taylor series expansion of this aspect of the equation. And by expressing it in Taylor series, then you have a polynomial. He truncated it at the fourth order. Since you have a fourth order degree polynomial, which is what I express here at the end of the day, we can solve for a polynomial by just finding the root of the equation. And finding the root of the equation, you are going to get four different roots for a fourth order polynomial. But it turns out in this case that the polynomial is convex. By convex, you can you, you, you have a form of like a bow if you if you plot the graph for the function. And in that case, you can only have two real roots and two complex uh, pairs. And what we are concerned with is the real roots. And for the real roots, you are going to have one that lines within the limit of your integral and one that is outside that limit. So you can easily figure out this true solution, which he denoted as HY. And then he went on to the optimization aspect. The optimization aspect is what he is trying to obtain here, which is his Y optimum. Um, that Y piece there then solved for the photoelectric effect. The X was denoted as the Compton effect, which we already solved by solving that polynomial. We have that value. And then we can go ahead to use that value to, to get what Y should have been. And by doing that, we are just using this, um, sometimes I can't find my cursor. Okay, we're just using to minimize this expression. That is, if I measure an I2, that is I measure an intensity at the detector from with a higher energy, I can calculate, I think I make a mistake in my equation here. This should be S2, not S1. This should be S2. I can calculate what Y should be by like a, an iterative process where you just change the value for Y, knowing your X value. You, we know all of this already. We solved for this from the polynomial. We know this because there is a physics equation that already described that from, from the clinician uh, Compton equation. We can calculate this. We know this from the polynomial solution. And then you can optimize Y by putting in a Y value that minimizes this whole expression that gives us, the, that returns the minimum value for this expression. So in that case, we now have our A1 and we have our AR and CR, which already gives us those values to decompose our image. And so every other material can then be expressed as a linear combination of AR and CR. That way, when we go ahead to we form our sinogram, we're gonna have two sinogram, and then we can use all the normal CT reconstruction algorithm like the feta back projection and every other thing to get our image. And he went to the optimization method. The optimization method, there are lots of optimization methods out there. I'm not so much familiar with this set of methods that the author used. I'm a little bit familiar with the gradient descent method. Um, in, that, in that instance, for optimization, what you're just looking for is a maximum and a minimum. You want to get what is the minimum in this, in this graph, for instance, this is where we want to get. So the author described a form of a non-derivative method. Normally I'm, I'm familiar with the derivative method where you're just taking the derivative at different points and you're checking which one is zero. 
because at the minimum, your gradient should be zero and that gives you the minimum. Then you can optimize your program. But in this case, he used a non-derivative method whereby you are looking, you are searching different components in that, in that um, equation. For instance, if, if we divide this into three different sections, we can search this component, this aspect of the whole um, equation and search this, compare the two value and see which one is higher or which one is lower, and then use that idea to shift, to shift a, um, this array again to another point and that's what they do. So they just bin, they bin them, search the function at that point, search the function at the other end, and then keep on shifting that until it approaches the minimum. They keep on shifting. So this is not a derivative method. They ju they're just looking at the value that is least, the, va the least value returned by searching at different range in the values. That, that's what a good section search do. It's this is just a graphical representation, not more like getting into the weeds of this guy here. So another method the auto mentioned was the parabolic interpolation. And I just have a typical representation here where you have your function and you denote, you just pick three different points in your function and fit those with a parabola. When you have a parabola uh, fitting that function, you can then easily get the minimum of that parabola and use that to shift all the two, all the points. For instance, here we create a minimum. The minimum is, somewhere here above this the true minimum then you that idea is used to shift c to b and then b goes to x then you create another parabola until you, until the act the minimum of that parabola match up with the minimum of your function so like i said these are non-derivative method of optimization they are different method of optimization this aspect is what is this concept that was used to calculate the y piece which is the photoelectric effect component in that uh, projection decomposition. Moving on to how the author implemented this, um, he used open softwares to generate the energy spectrum. So this is a kind of experiment we can research that one can do without actually going to the clinic to get any data. There are a lot of software out there that can help us generate S3 energy spectrum build a numerical phantom that we can put in value of attenuation coefficient, send our beam through it and look at what comes out of it. And we can work backward. That is, we know what the results supposed to look like. And then we work backward to understand the process that is going on. Like I said, the author then compares his own method with other methods. I'm going to quickly rush through this. So these are some open software that I found online. But this is exactly what the author used to generate his S3 beam and then sent it through some um fun and this i found this paper that looked at some projection data that was obtained is a is a large source that one can go there get a lot of sinogram and use to practice and these are some materials we can use to build open uh there are open software that we can use to build numerical phantoms to test um what the results should be they are listed and i believe they are a lot of these out there. These were just the three I was able to find while reading through the material. And going to how the author implemented it. So the author then designed his own phantom. He knows all the material in here because he specified their values. So this is the, he created one phantom and split them into what the photoelectric effect will look like. This is the Compton piece. And you can see you can't, there's no much of a contrast when you're looking at Compton re, uh, regime, because in that case, electron density for almost all material are kind of the same going to the Compton range. But the contrast really comes out in the photoelectric effect range. And that's what is shown here. Then the author implemented this method and sees how that compares with the true um, stuff that he made. And you can see from the graph that they a little bit relate. And this method is really more like a one-step approach. We are, solving the solution of a polynomial, then you're using that value to optimize for the second value, and then you implement the two of them. The author compared that with the other uh, method that have been available. This is a, a lookup table method. The lookup table method as described by the author was uh, more like using a grid whereby you have the attenuation, the, sorry, you have the intensity passing through the object, then you take that intensity and grid them together, finding the inverse, more like the metrics approach that I showed earlier on, and then using that to solve for X and Y. 
In this case, you will find that, that the photoelectric effect was totally messed up compared to a method where you just plug in values trial by error to kind of optimize the X and the Y value. And again, after using many trials, that's when it got to a really good one that, can, that is comparable, but this has a lot of computational cost. It's going to spend time. In fact, the value the author used to generate this one had to come up from the lookup table. That means it's, this method will be a two-step approach compared to the other method where you're just solving for the answer of a polynomial and the other one. Okay. So the author showed that his method is fast and it's easy to implement and can be used to, so the next step will be to try this out in a clinical setting. And from that, I just have the limitation of the paper. And what we can do next is explore the open software platform that are available. The image domain method is a little bit easy to implement because you're just working with metrics and you're doing inversion uh, as long as that decomposition matrix is invertible, that it is, has a non-zero determinant, you can easily work on that to get the image domain method implemented. And then you have two set of images that tells you information about the chemical composition of your actual image. And the other aspect I think would be interesting to look at is how to suppress the noise, because there'll be different uh, functions that can be designed to suppress noise depending on the noise that shows up in an image. That is everything I have running through this. Thank you. I'm not a presenter. I turned up being one. Any comment? So how how do we how do we think um, this can be like ap this is applicable to us and where actually do we think this is useful? Maybe we can pick up from that. So right now, I think I expect everybody to be able to contribute, even though I know I was rambling or through the old. <laughs> the floor is open. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yemi, um, for the insightful presentation and for walking us through the various um, models uh, that were developed. Um, when you mentioned how uh, it could be applied in the clinic, I sort of asking um, a question. Um, in the AAPM task group report 291, um, one of the things that they mentioned was the impact of uh, this dual multi-energy CT on uh, patient reduction dose. Uh, and I was wondering how do we sort of balance the, uh, because it's still an involving technology anyways. So how do we sort of balance this uh, uh, multi-energy CT spectrum with uh, uh, Dosimetry number one with uh, patient radiation dose number two, uh, 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 and mostly uh, um, how does it really affect uh, 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 patients and what's the overall benefit uh, to uh, the public? Yeah, that's that's my question, and um, perhaps a clarification from me. Thanks. Okay. Does anyone want to go? Thank you very much for the question. Um, maybe not, I'm not able to get the name, but I'm thinking that's Mr. Bayomi. I only have numbers showing up there on your Zoom, but I think that's Mr. Bayomi from The Voice. I hope I'm not mistaken. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, I can leave anyone to answer the question. But, but just to say that Actually, if we're looking at the dose symmetry aspect, of course, every we know that every um, so every technology or whatever we're thinking about, we have the pros and cons. In that case, you, we're going to have some disadvantage. But to be frank, there are a lot of repeated CT that are done even with the conventional CT we do right now. There are a lot of repeated CTs. Not so we 
technically we're not just going to be some patients get there more than once for instance if you're doing uh radiation therapy and you want to do a form of adaptive treatment you have to image the patient again even you do that during your ct setup and you do that during your during, sorry you do that during your simulation and you also do that during treatment for your patient setup so in in one way we are doing not just giving the patient we're not just imaging the patient once even right now with the conventional ct and so if the dose from all of what those combined repeated ct doesn't amount to much of detrimental effects to the patient i think this wouldn't really have much of an effect in the in the sense that it, the 20 2009 report on um radiation uh, exposure in the united states the largest contribution was from ct and that was without dual energy CT, but maximum was still below the background radiation. I mean, looking at the entire population, the entirety was still below the background radiation. So actually from the dose we received from CT wouldn't, um, well, that, that's a population average anyway. But again, I, I would acknowledge that it's a limitation, but compared to the, the benefit would come from the fact that it will come from the diagnostic, diagnostic aspect because you are able to separate out different materials. For instance, let's say we have meta artifact in a patient that is, sorry, let's say we have meta implant in a patient and you're imaging the patient, you're gonna have strict artifact because as your beam is passing through that high, high density material, the algorithms that we have right now cannot reconstruct that very well because that, that's a beam hardening problem. And so you have a lot of streaking artifact, that place is really shiny and everything. But if you're using a dual energy CT, you can attend with that effect. And so you can see other structures that are behind the meta implant. So that, that have a benefit. And if you're doing a form of contrast CT, where you have the constra contrast in the patient, you can easily, again, like I said, you can have two intensities showing up in your screen and you think they are the same material, but they may not be, just because one of them may have a higher chemical composition rather than a higher mass density. And so you may be seeing something that looks like bone and is not. So dual energy CT will help us to solve that problem. And that would, uh, that would help in that case. I don't know if I answered the question. I mean, perfectly, perfectly. Okay, thank you. The energy range, okay, there's a question on the energy range for dual energy CT. So it's 80 kV, most of the one I've seen is 80 kV and, uh, 120 and so they can take two images simultaneously the, the different vendors have different ways they implement it some some machines now have like two sources that takes the image simultaneously they ju they're just auto orthogonal to each other so you can have um, 80 kv and 120 kv of course that would bring in a lot of different uh, things to consider like the heating and all of other stuff and so people do it like they have two detectors set up such that they rapidly switch the beam, uh, the energy of the source, the energy, so that um, two different detectors can pick it up at that. So there are different ways they implement it, but a, a crude way would just be to take two images, one with a low energy and one with a high energy. And then from that, express, factor out what could have been the material composition in the two images that you're looking at. And I think, the image reconstruction method is really, really, um, maybe, maybe a little bit handy. Okay. Dr. Yubasa, uh, please go ahead. Network issue. Oh boy. Thank you very much. For the presentation, I don't know. Can you hear me? My net is very bad here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello. Was okay. there any place in the paper where um, there was a benefit of this uh, method? Um, for uh, uh, diagnosis, for cancer, diagnosis of cancer. I don't know, was it, was it mentioned anywhere in the paper? It's not explicit, <laughs> explicit uh, it was not so explicit 
for like a particular um, advantage or benefit, but the TG, APM TG kind of covers Inter that. Okay. Yeah, the TG, the TG showed a lot of, sorry. Okay, because I'm not, I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking, I mean, if, you know, we're saying uh, dual energy cities are good for differenti differentiating between materials or tissue that have the same, you know, city number. City number. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'm just thinking, you know, um, I can't remember, I don't know if it's in PET now, where they do this kind of dose painting, you know, uh, in, in a particular uh, tumor, you could have different cancer cells that have, um, you know, different um, radio sensitivity or some, you know, something like that. Some could be more hypoxic than others. And this kind of affects the way they respond to treatment. So, and you know, normally we just prescribe a particular uh, amount of uh, radiation dose to, to the whole tumor. Meanwhile, there are different sections of the of the tumor, you know, that are responding differently to the cancer. So I'm just thinking if maybe this kind of technique could help, you know, in sort of um, in segmenting, yep. you know, the cancer tumor, such that we can say for set for 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 certain that okay, this tumor, this part of the tumor is has this characteristic, this part of the tumor has characteristics. So we can now do a kind of um, more personalized treatment uh, prescription to that, you know, rather than just giving a generic, um, um, I don't know if that makes sense. So um, I mean, that would, that would be, that would be something that would be, you know, anyway, that would be worth ex exploring. Yeah. I don't know if, um, and then again, you mentioned something, sorry, my network was going off and on. So you mentioned something about that, this is a kind of research that can even be done without using a, without um, patient, using a patient or something, without using patient's data. I don't know if we could maybe kind of simulate yep. that uh, tumor environment. Maybe we could kind of simulate the tumor environment and investigate that using this um, decomposition um, technique that was proposed by this author. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes. Perfectly. I think I think I think that's one of the strengths of dual energy city. You can easily tell that variation in tumor types and um, in terms of anything that can help us explore the chemical, um, because that variation will come out from tumor vasculature and every other aspect of it. So it's not just like it's a prostate cancer, yes, but within the prostate cancer, there are different segments. Some aspect of it are closer to oxygen, so oxygen than the other. You, are, you have a region of necrosis and all of other stuff. So using a technique like this would help us to actually identify those regions because now you can separate everything based on their material composition and know why this one is a bright signal, this one is dark a little bit and the likes and yeah. know how best to treat it. I think I think it's something worth exploring. I really think yeah. it's something worth exploring. And, and, and then in the, in the AAPM journal, uh, they, they, they mentioned a multi... I have never seen a... Most of the city um, machines in the market are dual energy cities. I've not seen a, a multiple energy city. Um, so more than two, three, more than two, three, four energies. I don't know. Why, why do you think that? Because I mean, it was in the AAPM. I think it was mentioned in the... So I don't know. Why, why is that more common? Is there, is there a problem? I don't know. It's... Um, hello. Yeah. Hey. Hello. Hello. We can hear you. We'll be you. Okay. Um, I, I feel I should just uh, make a little bit of um, contribution, please, with my um, limited um, uh, knowledge on the um, city. I want to be um, very soon, uh, multiple energy and um, city would be the gold standard for city. I, um, I tend to believe a major concern with uh, multiple energy, multiple energy city, just uh, because of uh, the uh, technicalities involved, especially uh, with the scan head, how to incorporate them um, so many, um, whether they're going to use a, a single source, then you have uh, different um, energies, maybe at 80, just in one um, swoop of um, the gantry, you have um, three energies, maybe 80, 100, 120, and so on and so forth. 
So uh, there are so many uh, problems uh, that uh, presents because they are using the same um, city machine. So there will be a kind of, um, um, I would like to call it um, overlap of uh, one imaging chain on the other imaging chain. So you're going to bring um, a lot of um, uh, some problems. And also, I want to believe um, the issue of um, algorithm um, also comes into play. I, it is also one of the places um, where MRI has some um, edge over CT because in MRI, for example, if you want to do maybe SC smear or so, one can actually have um, so many chain within, within one um, one particular um, um, operation. One particular operation, one can have um, different um, imaging and uh, I've forgotten the name. Um, okay, for example, multiple like, spin echo. You can have um, multiple images within the same uh, spin echo acquisition. So I want to believe uh, that trying to build that um, in city because um, this is one of the uh, limitations of um, a city having one particular image, which at times doesn't um, actually characterize um, the um, different um, tissues very well. So I believe. Um, um, CT, um, dual energy CT will soon become a gold standard in, um, in the um, CT commercialization. That is um, the way I look at it. Um, to your question, I believe the constraints are mainly for me due to uh, the technicalities. I mean, the, how do you make it um, much more, uh, because they're also looking at um, the cost because I'm having uh, maybe three, five energies, uh, I mean, three, I mean, five um, sources, city sources, of course. Uh, we're also going to look at um, the detector's um, arrangement. How is every of that then going to play out? In fact, uh, the use of uh, this and dual energy, right from, uh, uh, I think, uh, in the mid 70s, in the uh, house piece, um, they have actually. They actually did something on that, but it's not been developed until recently. I want to believe it just because of the technicalities involved and maybe algorithm development and all that. And that is why um, we are still um, into research of um, looking at uh, at least uh, making the city because we're also looking at uh, the market value, how it is going to be affordable. And some of these things they can actually be done, but if you look at uh, the uh, prohibitive nature of the cost, I think we are they're going to look at uh, maybe trade offs. So that's just my only two uh, contribution to that. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'm looking at how we're doing so far on time. I think our oh. time is fast spent. Um, if we still have... The... I would like to uh, say something. Uh, oh. uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Yemi, for the wonderful presentation. Though it was not supposed to be a presentation, I really apologize for not reading uh, early. Uh, but uh, I would, I would just like to say from from uh, uh, some of the things I got from the things you said, and some of the things I know about uh, uh, multiple energy CT. Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the one of the places where it is uh, really important is in the diagnostic aspect of uh, uh, radiology. In uh, radiotherapy, it is being used for const contrast separation usually. So they give a contrast agent like uh, the question Dr. Yobusa was asking. Uh, they they look at contrast that would enhance a particular side of a tumor. So they give the contrast and then they take the CT and instead of taking two different CTs, they take just one CT and separate what the normal without contrast will be from what with contrast will be in just one shot to reduce the, the scanning time as well as the dose to the patient. So, uh, however, there is one comment you mentioned that I would like to... There, is, there, there are other uh, reconstruction algorithms that are actually... Uh, that they that that have something similar to this multiple energy city in a single energy unit. We, one of them is the metal artifact reduction uh, reconstruction algorithm. So yeah. with this, this can help not as much as uh, the multiple energy city to deal with strict artifacts within images and, and all that. And uh, 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 Dr. Madhu also mentioned 
uh, multiple energy city being the gold standard in future? Well, in my own opinion, I think he made a comment that made that uh, 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 the comment for MRI where he mentioned that you can take multiple projection in just one shot. And uh, I think if I'm an administrator and I want to purchase a unit, uh, if I think about the cost, I don't think, I don't see a reason why multiple energy CT would actually outperform normal CT scan unit. I think, uh, I think it will still stay mainly as a research tool because they are very, uh, they are very advanced technique with lower dose to the patient and uh, fast acquisition that can actually do something similar to what uh, 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 multiple energy CT is doing. But I would like to thank you again for the wonderful presentation. Thank you very much for your contribution. Do we have other comments while we try to wrap this up? Um, I have a question, please. Um, I missed an important detail in the paper um, about the phantom. I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, the only labeled the tissues by characters tissue one, tissue two to tissue nine. Yep. Even though they give the atomic number, but uh, they didn't specify or tell us the specific tissues that the phantoms represented or simulated. Um, I was just wondering why the detail was missed in the paper. Um, perhaps this was a limitation. I wanted to get your thoughts on this. Uh, I think this is just playing with numbers because obviously your attenuation coefficient will look something like this, numbers. So instead of like identifying a particular tissue, they just want to test the strength of their method. And so plugging in some numbers and seeing, if you look at it, you see that the numbers increases on the table just from, from one to nine, the number increases. That way we say it's increasing atomic number increasing, uh, they make the density, they vary the density. So it can be, a, it's not like a particular tissue, but it's to, it's, it's to like check the, is a, is a proof of concept basically. I think that's what they work with. So they have not identified a particular tissue. It's just, does this method work if we have different atomic number, different mass density, different uh, molar mass? What's the A? I can't remember what it calls the A, but I think the A is the uh, atomic. Average molar mass. mass. This is the molar mass. Okay. So that, that's, that's the basic thing. But one of the things I see as a limitation to the paper was the ambiguity in its expression of variables. I think some, at some point they were a little bit confusing because it used P to denote different things use Y to denote different things. And it was a little bit confusing when I was reading that. So at some point, P was for the um, photoelectric effect, energy dependent path, that's P of E. Later I denoted P not P1 to represent polynomia. And that was a little bit ambiguous. Then H, Y, X equals H of Y was to represent the solution for, for the Compton path, where Y itself was the solution for the photoelectric effect. So there's a little bit of ambiguity in the variable declaration, I think. Um, but it remains to see how this can be used with clinical data and I, just, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think with respect to the phantom, I think uh, uh, what he used is similar to the cat fan uh, uh, with uh, the uh, different tissue like uh, uh, polyethylene, water, air, and I think it's. I think I think what they use is the cat fund. I think what they use. Okay. Thank you for catching that. Okay. Any other comments? Because we need to wrap everything up. Um, we're far beyond time. So there's a question in the chat section from oh. Dr. Akinladi. Chat section question. 
can data from dual so the question says can data from dual energy ct be used to improve treatment plan algorithm so what's our take on this uh treatment planning algorithm treatment planning algorithm is uh, i think this is a different thing because uh, calculating the dose in the treatment planning system basically depends mainly on the way we characterize the tissue is by having this electron density curve. So I don't see a way, the, the only thing that, the only place where it will be useful is for adaptation and uh, uh, escalation of dose. I mean, this is, these are the places that uh, it has been used mainly. So for example, you have a tumor and within the same tumor you want you have a uh, you have a better uh, uh, segmentation of uh, two different areas where you can boost one area and give the other area the uniform dose that is supposed to get. So I think mainly what the what uh, dual energy city have been used for mainly in radiotherapy treatment is for is for dose escalation. Those, uh, those boosting of these specific areas that they see as being hypo hypoxic. Uh, I'm kind of seeing a form of possibility. What about the there. contrast and accuracy of the? Okay, sorry. I was going to say, Mr. Lukman, what about in, in terms of improving um, um, the contrast and accuracy of? Um, delineating, delineating um, tumors. Well, that, that makes sense. It is almost similar to the same thing I was saying, because at the end, for you to escalate, you have to, okay, yeah. to escalate. Yeah, that, that's my, I don't know what uh, Mr. Yemi wants to say. Yeah, I was thinking in the, I, I was oh, okay. thinking, I was yeah. thinking in the light that for your dose calculation, we're, we're using a, a city number to electron density uh, map, right? We have, we have a conversion where we're taking, assuming that this intensity, this on field unit is equal to this kind of electron density. Mm -hmm. So, but there'll be, if we have two, this, if we have the same CT number, then we map it to technically the same material and that may not be the case. Okay. So, exactly. so dual analysis may still be good in, I think it may still be good in the Pania algorithm because we want to, and even the conversion algorithm from going from answering units to electron density needs a form of um, energy correction. Remember, we're working with the low energy units to get, we're working with low energy to get our image, and then we want to treat at a high energy. So there is still a form of conversion going from low energy to high energy. Now we are getting an image that is energy dependent, but the current one we use now is not energy dependent. It's just working on a single average energy, which is not true because our beam is poorly uh, poly energetic so we can it, it will just make the whole thing complex because i don't know if it's going to improve our treatment more than one percent or two percent i don't know it will make everything just more complex but i think it may improve it a little bit knowing that we can have the same answer units but different material but our current uh curve will just map it to one single electron density which may be erroneous so it may be useful i think I think, yeah, I think TG291 also mentioned something like that, where they had, uh, no, it was the, it was the first publisher, this um, Alves, what's the paper, Al I don't know how to pronounce that name, sorry. Albert Markovsky and um, Robert, I'll just call it. The, the, one of the paper that the author cited was a 1976 paper, and that, also give an example using lesion characterization like you mentioned already. So from the onset, we want to get the electron density. If we mistook it for something else, which is not, then we treat it as such. So I think it may be good in planning algorithm. I think so too. Though it might not, the difference might not be too much like uh, Mr. Lukman has said, but yeah. I mean, we... <laughs> We want it to be as accurate as possible. So, <laughs> yeah. So, the more accurate and precise we are, yeah, I think. <laughs> so, but the difference might not be too much. And like you, you also rightly said, it might be a very complex, it might make the thing, the, 
the whole thing more complex. But well, anyway, let's see. We're all still exploring. We are 17 minutes above time. I don't know. So it's it's up for discussion how long we want the journal club to go because again, this is something you will we're doing together, and I think it's an interesting, it's been an interesting experience for me so far from the two that we've done. And today was supposed to be a test run of an approach, like I said from the beginning, where we don't have a presenter. If it's a journal club, we're just discussing the paper. But it turns out I ended up presenting. Thank God I had a plan B. <laughs> but in the first instance, where we, when we did this at first, we had a presenter. So this, and again, the team will meet and evaluate both approach and see and come up with a position on that for the next meeting. Uh, right now, I mean, we will communicate the dates for the next meeting. We we'll hope to send the paper ahead of time also so that we can read it. And then hopefully by that time, we know which method we adopt and um, we get to know one another better from like we did today. We Oh, there's still one person that we forgot to introduce the other time. I know Dr. Bidemi introduced herself earlier on, but one of them wasn't able to get back to us because of network. Is Mr. Kayade able to do that now? Just in one minute before we wrap up. One, two, go. Okay. All right. I think. Mr. Kayade had a Sorry? Network. So just oh. forget about it. Mr. Kayade okay. has a very special internet service. Okay. okay, he's trying to talk. Okay, okay, he's actually on. Sorry, sorry. Oh. Mr. Kid. I think we should go ahead. We can't. Okay. We can't wait. I think we're done. There was a question that says, "Can we get the link to the online software for practice?" Yes, I think it's, um, I don't know if I put the link. So it's an open software, just if we, if we search for the name Tomo Phantom, we're going to see it, X Design, we're going to see it, Series, we're going to see it, and there's a lot of them. And all these ones have different coding platform like C++, MATLAB, Python, that they are built with. So whichever one we are comfortable with, we can use it. Um, yeah. Okay. I believe it's time to go and sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>